bought a uh, treadmill desk, I think, back there, because we would have actually been it. able to move faster to get uh, to get wired. So, you guys are still coming out? Yeah, and I hear so somebody in the background. Like so this is fantastic. Consumer Electronics Show, right? You want your tech to come out? Oh. Hey, Brody. We can oh, hello. Sorry, I had to get my cup. Cool. So I, uh, my name is Brian Seelander from Whistle Sports Network. I get to be the before photo uh, compared <laughs> to these two guys today. We're, uh, we're here to, we got asked to talk about millennials and changing behavior and getting people up and excited and getting them moving. Um, the last section talked a lot about sort of fitness from a corporate perspective. We really focus on this sort of under 30 model. And uh, at most of the sessions yesterday, we heard so much about the changing way that people consume content. 25% like of people under 30 have actually canceled their cable subscription or didn't have one in the last year that uh, people now watch, check their phones 8 billion times a day, 8 billion times a day in watch America TV. alone, and you're watched, right? <laughs> uh, and that even the people that do watch TV, 52% of them now actually put a second screen up between them and the TV. So even when you're sort of watching TV, you're actually sitting there with another screen. So that's a pretty big challenge, I think, to the fitness industry, or seems like it, because now you've got seven or eight different screens to stop you from being fit, because there's so many different ways to entertain yourself. And then the industry's got another problem with its, up, with its future customer base. Um, millions of kids have dropped out of team sports. So since 2008, from between 2008 and 2015, there's been a 7% decrease in the total population of kids that now play team sports. And uh, we've worked with the Aspen Institute and some other organizations to find out why. And part of it is so many parents are paying for tutors and private lessons and things like that. So, uh, and then there's this increased competition. So if you're not on the traveling team by 10 or 11 years old, uh, you're not going to play soccer anymore. You're not going to play football. You're not going to play baseball. And so that mix of digital lifestyle and drop off of team sports means you've got this whole generation of people that are less fit, less healthy and less willing to buy things like fitness tech, which as an industry is a fairly big challenge. But we think that we found since we launched uh, January of last year a way around that, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Brody showed me beforehand this great commercial about this kid that says, hey, I really want to be Russell Westbrook, <laughs> right? And then these people come up and say, no, man, you can be Russell Westbrook. But the weird thing is, like, he probably can't be, right? Can and I think more kids than ever are recognizing that they're not going to get a chance to be that NFL star or that Major League Baseball star. Uh, and they're looking, but they still very much want to be pro athletes, right? Mm -hmm. They still very much want to be fit and active. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're under 30, you found that instead of just your marquee in-stadium athlete, there's this whole new world of digital celebrities that people under 30 absolutely idolize, that they engage off the charts with. And uh, you guys are two of those. So I uh, sort of wanted to explain to the folks in, in fitness tech uh, and the folks that are very much eager to grab that 14 to 30 year old consumer, uh, what you've been able to do that's different and special and really engaging. So, um, you know, Kevin, the last time you and I saw each other, we were with Michelle Obama. Yeah. And uh, she had brought us together with her friends like Jessica Alba and uh, Jordan Sparks to try and figure out how to make kids more healthy. And then Brody, you were gonna be there with us, but you were on The Amazing Race. So, um, yeah, what got you guys into the world of being digital superstars that really drive the hearts and minds of 14 to 30 year olds? Right. You know, mine was pretty much like accidental. I was um, pretty like overweight and I was just tired of weight cycling, going back and forth between periods of being skinny and overweight. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna start to blog about my entire um, like journey and I'm going to share every single thing that I'm gonna eat online. And the whole idea was to try to gain the system and get people to share back with me. And what I found out was that people are really hunger, uh, hungry for like this type of content. And so uh, my following just began just to kind of like take off because there wasn't someone out there, like, you, know, you know, like a regular Joe, just sharing out their content so freely and openly. And I was showing how to do it. I was showing the, mic you know, the macros and the calories because I'm never going to be able to be like a Brody Smith, but I can be the best Kevin Curry that I can be. And a lot of people really love that idea. And so um, it just took off and I, it, it created like a, you know, like a whole new like, career for me um, in two years. Uh, now you've got a couple million fans and followers. You say when I put this out, what kind of content are they working with yeah. to consume? Um, so most people like the fact that I, I can create really easy, practical recipes and show them how to do it within 15 seconds or actually like one minute. So people don't have to become like a regular chef. And also, I mean, I'm from the South and I love food and I don't want to have to eat you know iceberg lettuce and boiled chicken breast and steamed broccoli just to stay fit. It's not going to work for me. It just doesn't work. So my idea is just to kind of show people that you 
can eat healthy and eat well and make it really easy like, and affordable. And so people really like that approach. Cool. Now, Brody, you actually are a pro athlete. You've won multiple championships as an ultimate Frisbee player at the college and pro level. But uh, you got really famous <laughs> not through that, right? Yeah. So it was an individual experience that you had that really kind of rocketed you onto things like The Amazing yeah. Race and, and getting a, like six million you know, views on a single video. It was one of those late nights, I'm sure we've all had them, where you know, we don't really want to do anything, so we just go onto YouTube and we kind of do the YouTube spiral where you're just like, how did I end up on this video uh, an hour later? <laughs> but um, I was kind of looking up uh, Frisbee videos and I was very interested in if I'm a normal person that doesn't really know anything about Frisbee and I type in Frisbee into Google, what videos show up? And the two main videos that I kept seeing were people either explaining incorrect technique or you know teaching the wrong way or uh, videos of guys in tie-dye shirts with ponytails and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so it, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, what if there is that kid out there that loves to play football or basketball and sees Frisbee and wants to you know, get into it, yeah. there's, aren't, there's not really a great video for that person to watch. And so I started making tutorial videos. I got 5,000 views in the first week of my first how to throw a backhand, uh, which we were ecstatic about. And then one of my buddies was like, hey, make a trick shot video. So I made a trick shot video in the first week. We got, I think, 450,000 views. And that kind of opened my eyes of, wow, there's a lot of people out there that all of a sudden are looking at a Frisbee a different way and going, that's kind of cool. So basically just started from that and you know, now have gone out and done all sorts of different kind of things with the Frisbee. And, and really, honestly, now it's even branching out to where I get to just kind of travel around and people kind of just follow along mm -hmm. and see all the cool stuff that we do. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, if you, if you haven't sort of lived in the digital space, like you guys are legit celebrities. Like we were at VidCon together and people were like, oh my God, it's Brody Smith, right? And, uh, and we'd get these, these uh, kids who, oh my God, mom, it's Brody Smith, right? And, uh, and, and at uh, uh, Michelle Obama, it's like, oh, but Kevin, I did say senior. And like, they, they react to you the same way that they react to the people that they watch sitting on the couch with their dad uh, or mom watching sports. But you're more accessible. Uh, than some yeah. pro athletes because they I feel like it, they know you. I think it's also a little different too because, you know, LeBron James, Tiger Woods, those guys, they don't, like, if, if all of a sudden a thousand or ten thousand people stopped liking them, they're still going to be okay. They're very good at what they do. They're going to get paid. Yeah. Where us, we are what the fans are. Like, if the fans all of a sudden stop watching us, we don't get paid anymore. We don't have to make a living. <laughs> yeah. So... For us, it's, it's very important to share our passion, but at the same time, make, make sure that the people that are supporting us are enjoying it as well. And so I think there's a little bit of a deeper connection that Absolutely. we have with our fans than you know, some of the pro athletes that make millions of dollars off of whatever because of the their talents. Yeah. Well, well, it's also like relatable, right? Like I know that I can never like relate to like LeBron James going and doing something, but people can relate to me because they're like, this guy was just up there like big like two years ago, and I know that if he can do it, then I can do it too. And so whatever I post about, people really love because they see it's a really practical approach, and I can yeah. do that too. Great, and there's, and there's more than just views when it comes right. to your videos, right? No, um, yeah, definitely. It, I it's, mean, it's a, for me, it's really about creating a community. Um, it's awesome that you, know, you can post a video and it have 20 million views, um, but the thing I love about it the most is when you see a kid comment on an Instagram photo like, hey guys, check out my videos. And then, you know, I click on it and just be like, all right, let me see what this kid's doing. And he's got a thousand followers. And you see all the kids posting on his comments saying, oh man, sick trick shot. Like, check out mine. And like, that's what it's all about. It's like creating a community, um, having kids that, you know, I've run kit camps and clinics and stuff all over the world. And it's crazy when like two kids come show up and they're like, oh man, I follow you on Instagram. Like, oh, I follow you too. The like, kids, right? The, the yeah, fans the kids follow, follow each other. Follow each other. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. there's like a community there involved. Instead of so much like it's all about me, it's more about, hey, we all have this passion for this awesome thing and we're all enjoying it together. Absolutely agree. Absolutely. You know, um, it's the same thing, like, you know, with me, you know, Fitman Cook, it's just like, uh, you know, building that community, I didn't realize how large the community actually was until I actually get, you know, started getting hit up from like men's health and like bodybuilding.com and saying, hey, our athletes love you. And I'm like, what athletes? And I don't even look like your athletes. Why are they even following me? So it's really cool that, you know, you have no idea, you know, the areas and, and the reach of your content. But people are out there and they're watching. 
Um, and, and you know, and it's not about the views either, but it, it, it is about the quality like of the com, um, you know, the content. And it's so funny because especially with like men, we we tend to um, watch, but we don't engage. Yeah. Now, women, I always say this: women, by far and large, they are the number one driver of the Fitman Cook community because they'll comment, they'll engage, they'll tag their husbands and do this. Let's share this. This is a great recipe for girls' night and yada yada. But men, it's like we're actually watching and like consuming the content, but we don't necessarily like you know engage. But it's still important to kind of put that content out there yeah. because I know you know like even today showing up here I love your recipes bro you know but they but he never even like shares a photo oh, <laughs> you never, he, you yeah know, but you know you know you know but it's there maybe he knew you were coming to Vegas right? uh, he, I, he I could have shared it on, on Saturday. <laughs> yeah I guess so so if you're in the fitness tech community you're like well that's great that a bunch of people sort of 14 to 30 are watching people be active or yeah. sharing or liking uh, but does that actually make them active? So from your fan base, you know, what kind of influence or proof do you see that you're actually inspiring people to be healthy or do things or be out in their own backyard? Yeah, well, fr Frisbee's not the biggest sport in the world. I'm sure a lot of people in here don't even know anything about Ultimate Frisbee. Um, and so, especially from kids, a kid's perspective, a lot of kids aren't introduced to it. So I've run into a lot of people that say, hey man, I saw your videos, I went to my high school, I told some of my friends about it, and now we have a Frisbee team, we only had six guys show up the first practice, now it's the fifth, we have 20 guys. That's awesome. And so, they're, like, these kids are really taking it upon themselves and going out and trying to find other people to be like, hey, there's this cool thing, check out this video, let's try it ourselves. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you have, you know, one kid does that, 20 kids are playing that wouldn't be playing. So. Um, that's happened all over the world and it's really cool to see. I go to a tournament um, in Dubai every year and the first year I went there there was five teams in the Middle East that all came yeah. and I'm heading back there in the end of January I think they have 15 teams signed up. And so you have like just people that would never have really even known about a sport all of a sudden now getting together playing and really engaging with each other and, and, and getting active and, and doing something that's good for their body. Probably wearing the sneakers that you wear and the sweater. Yeah, that, you know, <laughs> exactly. The, your Dubai trick shot video is awesome, by the way. Oh, thank that's, you. We got like 15 million views on YouTube yeah. alone for that, right? Well, it's Dubai's a pretty, a pretty cool city, so it's Love pretty to easy there. to do something cool there. Cool. Kevin, uh, some examples of how people following you or engaging with you as a yeah. YouTube and yeah. social creator has led to them being more active? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a little bit easier, I think, for me just because I do just, you know, like talk about like healthy food content and also the technology that helps to like enable it. So whenever I post about, you know, like, you know the macronutrients and whatnot, number, um, first off, the Fit Man Cook app has been like great. It's like the number one app right now within 80 countries in food and drink that people have been able to use that in order to meal plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, um, whenever I share something that about like a product or whatnot, people are actually just hands on, like really want that. And it's just, it's the small things too. Because again, like, you know, they're not trying to become like Emeril or like Ramsey or whatnot. They just want to be like a better version like of themselves. And so it's like these small, like practical things to say, hey, you know what, this is a really good skillet. And all of a sudden, like a thousand screenshots and people are, you know, are like buying it in droves. Wow. And so yeah. I've got to be really, you know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess, strategic about like what I share out because first off I don't want people to have to spend a whole bunch of money that I spent when I was starting out trying out every single product oh, but okay, I know yeah. that like you know the stuff that I do share out the stuff that I, is I actually use it and you know and like stand behind cool so there's um, your question about when they see what you use they want to use it right? right and sometimes that's proactively sponsored by a company and sometimes that's just what you most like, right? Mm -hmm. That just happens to be what you most use. For me, it's both, though. That's it's what I mean. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's like I, I get pitched on a weekly with like tons of products. My, you know, like my condo is filled with like boxes and stuff that I still haven't even opened yet. But yeah. it's just I'm very slow about it because I actually want to be really smart about it too. Because for me, it, it literally is about the experience. I spent so much money and and I was so unhappy being like overweight. And people would post stuff, this diet pill, this 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 new tummy tucker trend, and I was doing everything. I was going broke doing. That. And I said, you know what? If I ever get the chance, I'm not going to do that to other people. And so, but and so that's why, you know, whenever I do share something, the response is always really big. Yeah. Well, there's there's an authenticity and a legitimacy that comes from the connection that your fans have with you. And we've got 320 creators now at Whistle Sports. We've got an aggregate reach of 150 million. We see it every one of them that there's this relationship. Like they they watch you, Brody, but they think of you as their friend. I saw somebody on Twitter last night like, oh God, I wish I could go, go to Vegas with you. And they mean that, right? They yeah. actually think like. I want to hang with Brody, or yeah. I want to hang with Kevin, or I want to hang with the dudes, or I want to hang with, with a bunch of folks. So when you start bringing brands into the conversation, there's a, an additional legitimacy or authenticity that comes with it, because yeah. you can't afford to 
you can't afford to bring into that relationship a yeah. brand that you don't feel good about, right? Yeah, and I would say too, working with brands, the worst thing that a brand can do is already have an idea and be dead set, like this is a home run. And so they come to you and then they're saying, this is what you're gonna do. And if you try to tweak it at all, they're like, no, 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 we got it. This is what we want. Um, the best is when a brand has an idea and says, oh, we think this person would be great for this, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. And they come to you with an idea and you're like, oh, let's tweak it a little bit this way or tweak it this way. And that way it will really resonate with my fans and it will make a lot more sense versus doing something where people, because whenever you watch something and you can tell the person's not engaged or, you know, just doesn't fit, it's just, it's just a swipe. It's a scroll to the next thing. Mm -hmm. It's when you actually can work with something and make it fit into what you already do that people are like, oh, what was that? Like, let me look at more into that yeah. Brody's using or whatever like that. And your fans know your voice. Your yeah. fans know your voice. Yeah, and, and they know, know when it's voice, not. Right? Exactly. But it's amazing how, how much you can stretch that voice to fit all kinds of uh, oh. products and things oh, too. Like we, we get a, a major movie studio. I don't know why. The video got like 38 million views on Facebook and YouTube, but we're not supposed to mention the name of the studio. <laughs> but anyway, it's, you know, it's, I took my kids there for vacation, right? Yeah. Uh, at that studio. Anyway, we can't, can't mention their name. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they brought one of their superstars and put him into the middle of this video. Uh, that we did before his big movie came out. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily inherently a sports thing, right? Mm -hmm. But the way that the superstar inter interacted uh, with our creators was fun and engaging and yeah. inspiring. And people went out and then took their own videos doing that same thing. Yeah. And so it was this great, great piece. So, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a difference in how people our age uh, think about advertising and how those sort of young millennials think about advertising. So, and I'm older, I'm a lot older than both of you guys, but uh, when I was growing up, commercials were something that you skipped, or you got off the couch and walked away from, and that was your chance, right? Mm -hmm. And even in the sort of TiVo or DVD age, uh, you would do that in parts you could skip commercials. But the under 30 crowd, like, genuinely enjoys, in some cases, the chance to be advertised to, if the advertisement is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, oh, this is a company that's trying to sell me something, it's, hey, this new product is trying to make me laugh for 30 seconds. Or this, like, this company has figured out that if I work with these seven people, I'm gonna learn something. Or I'm gonna like, get better at something. Or I'm gonna know how to cook something I didn't. And so while it might not be as blatant, like buy this, buy this, see this movie, see this movie, see this movie, it becomes, hey, thank you so much, Major Studio, for making me laugh for four minutes with this right. awesome YouTube video. Or making me laugh for six seconds on this Vine video. Yeah. Like I appreciate that. Um, and uh, as long as it fits with the voice, like they're willing to embrace advertising. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know, it, it, it's definitely, because it does go back to your voice, and actually I've been kind of, um, I guess, ping like in social media sometimes, or well, like one time, because it just took one time for me to post something that like, I didn't necessarily really enjoy the product, and people saw it like right away. Well, it's, it's probably because like, you went like this with your face. I wasn't like, I wasn't saying boom with that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say boom this time. Um, so when you threw up after yeah, next yeah. to it, then <laughs> like, like, yeah, wow. I don't think, this is I don't think gotta working. go and buy this show, it's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, for me, like in my channel, it just works best whenever I can just integrate it into like what I'm doing. So any product, you know, that I actually like to like endorse and it does really well this way is just to make it an extension of the lifestyle. And people want that, like, you know, and so go, going back to your point, you don't really have to, when you work with the creators, just to uh, quote unquote pee on all the content and make sure that your branding is everywhere and whatnot. People know it right away, and I guarantee you, even if I just post it up like just me, me like wearing this watch and talking about diet, hey, can what's that watch again? People will actually find out. You don't actually have to tell them, but they'll actually yeah. find out how to go and do it. But I think brands have to become like much more comfortable with this softer form and like this organic form of like marketing because that, I'm telling you, is the most trusted form, like word of mouth. Yep. Brody, you were one of the, uh, the first folks to get a major brand deal on Vine. So mm -hmm. you get a couple million loops on things. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was the challenge in trying to get a brand to connect with your audience in six seconds? I think the and did it work? I, I think the first challenge was just the brand saying, wait, we're paying you all this money for six seconds of content. <laughs> I think that was the biggest challenge. And also on a platform that really hadn't been used in that way. Um, but the thing about Vine is it loops, right? It just, you can sometimes, if you have a piece of content, and a lot of this stuff I post on Vine, I try to make it to where it's quick, so you don't really catch it the first time, so you have to watch it a second time, mm -hmm. just to see what happened. And then the third time, you're like, is that actually real? Mm -hmm. and, and to, to check. But um, it, it's really just about, again, like you said, creating something to where 
it, it makes the, the user have to do a little extra work to figure out what really is going on. Yeah. Because when they do a little extra work, then they're more engaged in that. And it's them almost finding out about it versus me saying, hey guys, check out this product, it's awesome. And then that's it, you know, because <laughs> they're not going to pay attention to that. But if I do a trick shot or something and I'm wearing a shirt that says something on it and they're all like, what's that shirt all about? You'll just look in the comments. My favorite too is with music. I just started now working with a lot of um, music people to get their songs out there. Yeah. And uh, we know we've, do we've done a couple of songs where, you know, they jumped up to top 10 on the iTunes chart in the day that I posted the Vine. And it's solely because you do something, it's got a catchy little six seconds, and everyone's like, what song was that? Like, I need to know what song that is. And the comments, literally every question is, what song is that? Oh, yeah. Someone answers. Two comments later, what song was that? Someone answers. And so it's really just about getting the content out there, letting them see it for themselves, and then letting them decide, do I want to seek further into the product that you're pushing, or the song, or whatever, or do I just want to swipe through? Because if you do push it down their throats, they're just going to swipe right past, and they won't even engage in it at all. Right, you've only got so many different <laughs> yeah. times to yeah. make it branded before. Exactly. You've got six Broke seconds too. So exactly. you can't you got six seconds. You can't be a lot of time though. Though to, <laughs> to, to mess around with. Cool. So um, Vine's interesting. So, you know, Vine was two CESs ago. Everybody was talking about you know, Vine was going to be the, the, uh, the, the biggest thing. And then if you looked at so Ad Week this week or a couple weeks ago, they talked about brands are spending less time on Vine now, and now they're all spending their time on Snapchat and mm -hmm. South by Southwest last year. Remember, everybody was all about Meerkat until they weren't for four days. <laughs> and then everybody was about Periscope, and they still are. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and now they're also yeah. about Periscope and Meerkat. So there's always this idea that the next platform may just knock the legs out from, from you. But it doesn't seem like that's happened for sort of social media stars. Like you, you guys started as sort of YouTube celebrities, right? Yeah. And now you're not, you're multi-platform digital stars. I, I how, do you, how do you keep, how do you, when something big like that pops, and this is as, as interesting, I guess, for the brands that are trying to do this with their own platform, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you remain flexible enough to, to bring in, oh, today it's Meerkat, I better do that. Oh, I guess it's Periscope, I better do that. Oh, wait, Facebook now does Facebook Live, so. Yeah. yeah. I, I would just say it's, again, it goes back to your content doesn't really matter what platform you're posting on, it's whether or not your content is actually um, shareable and enjoyable. Yeah. Um, and obviously, what I post on Instagram is a little different than what I post on Twitter with versus Vine. Like you you, you kind of make your, your content based on the platform a little bit, but it's still your content. Right. Um, and so, and I would also suggest too, don't waste your time on, like if you're a company that has no business with making a six second vine, don't spend any money or time making six second vines because it's just gonna be a waste, a waste of resources. Like figure out what you're good at, make sure you get really, really good at that first and then you start expanding versus trying to be on everything and doing everything oh, at once. Kevin, you were one of the uh, pioneers of Instagram video. Right. Right? Yeah. So what made you think, you know what, this is going to be where I'm going to really plant my flag? Well, my followers told me that, and then when I posted like the first one, it was like thousands of comments in my first video. I said, okay, maybe you all really want video here. So I actually backed up some of my YouTube stuff, backed that off for a little bit, and started to really invest heavily with an Instagram. So the key takeaway there is that I wanted to engage like natively where my fans are, um, and, they, and they can really drive in, uh, like drive that drive that whole like engagement. So it's not about trying to get on Snapchat and Twitter and Google Plus. What was it? Still, still alive. Still, 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 still alive. It's still going. Right? Right? And Periscope. It was about listening to what the fans actually wanted, and so they wanted those the, those quick videos. And so I said, you know what? I'm actually putting a lot of time like, talent in these videos. I wonder if I could actually use some of that content and put it now like on YouTube. So from Instagram, I actually went to YouTube, and now from YouTube, I'm going to Snapchat and doing like live cooking that way and so it's just this natural progression but it, you know you know but the key is just to remain different in these different areas so that way the engagement always stays high yeah snapchat doesn't give you a chance to even cook minute rice though right that's like no no, no but, but you snaps. know yeah, but i can get like a story <laughs> and the stories do do very well they, you know, yeah, they yeah. do actually very well which is surprising to me because i thought people would hate those but no they actually get like better engagement than instagram now Mm -hmm. um, because oh yeah, I'm a Snapchat are, addict. Oh, I mean, you are. Yeah. Oh yeah, and my kids and I love the filters. And so, like, my kids when I, when I take my daughter to piano uh, lessons on Saturday, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. Says, 
totally too young for our demo, but we love playing with the Snapchat filters. So while right. one of them is practicing piano, the other one will sit on my lap. We're like, oh look, she's a moose today. Or, yeah, oh, yeah. Look, she's, you know. And then, and then uh, I remember like Peanuts actually sponsored a sponsored Snap, I shouldn't talk about it because we didn't get paid for it, but uh, Peanuts yeah. actually sponsored a Snap filter. And mm -hmm. so she was sitting there and over and over again, Snoopy kept popping up over her shoulder. That's and you know, she, like, she, was, she was gladly advertised to for a good seven minutes in a row, right? Uh, and she loved the, you know, she, and we saw the movie, right? Because and then you wanted to go see Snoopy. It was there on, but it was there on Snapchat, and it was interactive, and it was right. her own face. It was her own face, mm -hmm. right, seeing this. And I think that what gets missed sometimes in the social media creators is, like, again, you might not ever get a chance to be Russell Westbrook. And the truth is, man, they're never going to get a chance to be a world champion, uh, ultimate Frisbee player, maybe. And they're probably not going to have your cooking, but uh, they're going to be able to have your skills. So mm -hmm. do you have questions? Uh, yes, I just want to have time to uh, yeah. open it up to questions. So does anybody have questions for Kevin or Brody? We have a microphone on that side now, and we have one on this side. Questions? I see people. Oh, there we go. What fitness tech do you see yourselves coming back to? You can mention brands or not, but what has been persuasive in your mind for um, you know, the, the tech throughout the ages and in the future? Sure. So, like, what what technology have people been responding to the most? Yeah, or I guess what fitness tech do you see yourself integrating into your own life, perhaps? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'll be blunt about it. Like, my fitness pal, and uh, my fitness pal has, has been around for like a couple of years now, and that was one of the ones that I use um, primarily to to get my you know my diet started. And people are really excited about that. And I think that what the thing is, you know, with like with like my fitness pal is that it allows people to. First off, create their own meal plans and track their own calories, which is super important, um, you, you know, these days. And there, with so many uh, like new products out there, people want to know what they're consuming. So it's a really educated like, generation that's actually being being like brought up. And so when you can get into in, into those types of apps that actually allow people to go and do that, I think you're going to see like success. Um, another one that I've seen like a lot of talk on, and this is. Um, well, I hope I don't get, get myself in trouble here, but uh, I, I've used both Jawbone and, and the Fitbit, um, and now my Apple Watch. Um, but this whole like calorie counting and um, uh, knowing, knowing the calories that you are expending, right? So those are really trendy, but what, what I've found out from followers and also just from myself is that they, they tend to have like a negative, like, um, they, it, it tends to kind of die off like after a while, you know, the initial, like, you know, like enthrallment in that. So I, I think that the challenge for you know, the tech industry is to find out how you can make those things a lot more sticky because there's only so much you can learn about your sleep pattern and, and how many calories you're burning until there's kind of like dying off. And so I think that one really cool way that I've been able to do this just through social content, it'd be great to do this now through like apps, like, you know, like my app, is to gamify this entire thing so that way you can kind of keep the, you know, keep the engagement high. That's been something you know, that I do personally. I do my own like, you know, monthly challenges with people. Your, your own app available for two ninety nine download? Oh, absolutely. You can go get that today. <laughs> yeah. um, but also just kind of um, creating those like daily, weekly challenges because people love those. I launched the calendar you know, for January, and it crashed my website. And yeah. it, within like five minutes, there were already like five thousand downloads of it, and I hadn't even like announced it yet. And people and yeah. your your, your so, calendar actually challenged people to clean out their fridge, take pictures of them fridge, cleaning out your fridge. Rip and send it to you so they're being active and then they're sharing and, it with you and then you get the data about who's most active which means you can then correct. tailor your stuff correct, correct. and so cool. these apps if they can do things like that you know you know like you know to gamify it and to make it really practical one last thing my friend said like you know Kevin the best thing that you can do is literally is to give me like an alert like every single day and just tell me what to do there it is <laughs> it's just you just give it up control just tell just Kevin just tell me what to do <laughs> every single day cool. just one thing sorry